Actually, they're doing a skit. That's what we're doing. <laughs> Inside the gate. Yeah. Oh, how happy I will be when life's journey here is run. And I look upon his face and I hear him say, well done. You have fought a faithful fight and my child, you kept the faith. Hit her now, my chores are yours, so just step inside the gate. Inside the gate. Just inside the gate. Inside the gate. Just inside the gate. Just inside the gate. Just inside the gate. No more to cry. Just inside the gate. No more to die. Just inside the gate. A crown of love. Just inside the gate. Just inside the gate. Just inside the gate. Your sorrows just inside the gate. Just inside the gate, just inside the gate, just inside the gate, just inside the gate, when I step inside the pretty gate. I will look for mother dear, y'all look for daddy too, right? And I'll look for daddy too. Sisters, brothers will be there. Heaven's joys with them I'll share. Then I'll hear little David play. Meet my Jesus on that day. Heaven's joys for me await. When I step inside the gate. Just inside the gate, inside the gate, just inside the gate, just inside the gate, just inside the gate, no more to cry, just inside the gate, no more to die, just inside the gate, 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 just inside the gate. Just inside the gate, just inside the gate, just inside the gate, when I step inside the pearly gate, just inside the gate, just inside the gate, when I step inside the gate.
mountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's saints and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all fountain in his day and there may I though vile as he wash all my sins away where would I be without your blood how could I ever know the depths of your love you have said Redemption, sweet flood, I'll praise you for your precious blood. Ever since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply. been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall be till I die redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die of your love you have saved me with redemption sweet blood i'll praise you for your precious blood you have saved me with redemption sweet blood i'll praise you for your precious blood blood wow all right tonight would you please open your bible to what i would think would be no better text to turn to tonight on an occasion which brings us together in the events of our country to second chronicles chapter 7 please verse number 14 second chronicles chapter 7 verse number 14 i want to uh say to the choir i appreciate the wonderful music this morning and I love the first song and the fourth song and the second and third song, too. They were all good. And uh, what a blessing this morning to be here and uh, again tonight. And uh, I want to say this also. Terrific Tuesdays begin the first Tuesday in July. Uh, this coming Wednesday is the first Wednesday of July. We will have a regular service this Wednesday, but then the following Tuesday, it'll be Tuesday, 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 and after that, uh, the rest of the Wednesdays, we won't have a service, but this Wednesday we will, normal time, uh, and then Tuesday we'll begin our terrific Tuesdays, okay? And I want to make that clear in case anybody was wondering about that. 
2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, I'm going to read it in just a minute. I'm going to read some more verses around it. Then we're going to come back to that verse at the end of the message tonight. And, uh, but I, I, think, uh, I, I think it's very fitting for tonight. We look at this verse, what it means, and uh, what does it mean to us. I had a complete total sermon prepared for tonight, but of course what happened Friday changed our mind on that, and, uh, and so uh, we'll look at a few things tonight. I pray it will be a blessing to you. As a matter of fact, the, the, the idea for this message tonight came from, don't judge me, it came from Facebook. And uh, I saw a post, and the post said this, uh, what is America's greatest need? And here was, I don't, know who, I don't know who posted this or whatever, but here is what they said. This is America's greatest need. Uh, and the number one was impeach Obama. Number two was repeal Obamacare. Number three was prosecute Hillary. Number four was take the Senate. Number five was abolish the IRS. And I think, well, maybe those things, if they were to be done by, I, I think, mostly tonight, I would think we're probably most of us tonight are conservatives, and we may enjoy those things to take place, and we may uh, actually cheer for those things maybe to take place, and, and if those things were to happen, we may be happy, but those things would not fix the main problem in our country. Uh, because these things, they may help America financially, and these five things may help America uh, politically and socially, but these five things would have no bearing whatsoever on America spiritually. Because spiritual problems can only be fixed by spiritual people. And so, who are the spiritual people? That's you and I tonight. And so I want to think about First Chronicles, or Second Chronicles, chapter seven, and that's kind of exactly what Solomon, or what the writer of this this book, is talking about when God speaks to Solomon. And here's what God says to Solomon in Second Chronicles, chapter seven, verse fourteen. I'm going to begin reading in verse eleven for context, and read down to verse twenty-two. Or emphasis is on verse fourteen. Second Chronicles, chapter seven, verse number eleven. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house he prosperously effected. So he finished building the temple, finished building his house, and it was time for a celebration in verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal, heal their land." Now mine eyes shall be open, and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now I ha have I chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever. And mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Verse 17. Now he's going to get uh, personal to Solomon. And as for thee... If thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, and do according to all that I have commanded thee, and shall observe my statutes and my judgments, then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom according as I have covenant with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. Verse 19. But if you turn away and forsake and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I set before you, and, sh and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I pluck them up by the roots out of thy land, out of my land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight, and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations." And this house which is high shall be an astonishment to every one that passeth by it, so that he shall say, Why hath the Lord done thus unto this land and unto this house? 
And it shall be answered, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods, and worshipped them, and served them. Therefore hath he brought all this evil upon them. Look back in verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. With God's help tonight, I want to preach on this thought. Uh, what is America's greatest need? What is America's greatest need? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again tonight for letting us be in thy house once again. And the Lord, we look forward to the activities in a few moments. But until then, God, it's the most important time of this day. It's a time for your message. So I pray, God, you may allow the music that's been sung and the spirit that's in here today, Lord, just be the precursor to great things ahead. As we preach your word tonight, Father, I pray you may bless like only you can. Fill me with your spirit, God. Use me to be thy spokesman, Lord, for your word. I pray, God, you may bless the reading and preaching of your word. I pray, God, you may add your blessing to it. You may do what only you can do tonight in our hearts. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take a few moments now, and I want to give us tonight, uh, I want to give us four things which are, in my opinion, not Facebook's opinion, but are what, in my opinion, are America's greatest needs. First of all, I think, number one, America really needs leaders that are looking up. Leaders that are looking up. Contrary to popular belief, America, we were established, we were founded on biblical principles. And they'll say, well, no, we come to America to make money. Or we come to America to establish our homes. And all that may be a benefit of coming to America, but America was established and founded based upon biblical principles. Because there was a day, folks, when our leaders, when they did look up to heaven, when our leaders, they, 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 they let God be in charge, and they looked to Him and His Word for guidance. Uh, there was a day when the Bible was the very center of all decisions made by our leaders. And, and by men who ran our country, they based what they wanted to do in our country by, Thus saith the Lord. There was a day when even the Supreme Court allowed the Bible to, uh, to affect their decision making. There was a day when, the, here's the difference, when statesmen in our country looked to the God of heaven for guidance. And there was a day when America flourished. It's no coincidence, the Bible says in Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I want to give you tonight a, a few quotes by the statesmen that our country used to have. It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, to humbly uh, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. George Washington. It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. George Washington. O oh, eternal and everlasting God, direct my thoughts, words, and work. Wash away my sin in the immaculate blood of the Lamb and purge, and purge my heart by thy Holy Spirit. Daily frame me more and more in the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that, that living in fear and dying in thy favor, I may in thy appointed time obtain the resurrection of the justified unto eternal life. Bless, O Lord, the whole race of mankind, and let the world be filled with the knowledge of Thee and Thy Son, Jesus Christ. George Washington, a prayer in Congress. Can you imagine a prayer in Congress like that today? The rights of the colonists as Christians may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, which are, uh, which are to be found clearly written in the New Testament. Samuel Adams. The, principle, uh, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. John Adams said that. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded by religionists, but uh, not by religionists, but by Christians. 
Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Patrick Henry. Uh, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secured when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that His justice cannot sleep forever. Thomas Jefferson. The Bible is the rock on which our republic rests. Andrew Jackson. Let me say it again. There was a day, folks, when our leaders, when our congressmen, when our president, when our Supreme Court, when they looked to the God of heaven, but I'm sad to say that those days are far behind us. Now our politicians aren't looking up. They're looking here for what they want to be said, looking here for what they want to be said, looking here for what they want to be said, and can care less about God and what God says. Listen, our country was founded upon the Bible and upon God's Word and upon the principles of this book. I don't care what the liberals say or what the, the, the New Age movement says. We are, in fact, a Christian nation, like it or not. But our, but our politicians today are a little bit different. Bear with me, please. Here's some more quotes, a little more modern. That experience guides my conviction that partnership between America and Islam must be based on what Islam is, not what it isn't. And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. President Barack Obama. I also know that Islam has always been a part of America's story. President Barack Obama. Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. President Barack Obama. And this one to me is, the sweetest sound I know is the Muslim call to prayer. President Barack Obama. We can't let an archaic writing such as the Bible get in the way of progress. Senator Harry Reid. I just uh, make up Scripture. If God opposes them, then He can just sue me. Nancy Pelosi. I hear the grumbling in your voices tonight. Just another way of saying this, there was a day, folks, when our leaders looked up. And our leaders looked towards the Bible. And it was also no coincidence whatsoever that it was also a day that our country flourished and that our country was number one in the world and our country topped the world in every category. But today it's not like that. Today our leaders are looking uh, at, some, at some poll or looking at what some book they read, looking at what, uh, what makes them look good and, and sound good. And can you imagine today that if our founding fathers ever dreamed of the day in which the United States of America, politicians would revoke their right to, 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 to wave a certain flag, but it's okay to stomp on the American flag. Can you imagine a day? Can you imagine that it ever be a day when, the, when, when people like John Jay and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington ever dream of in which the Supreme Court of our land would say, it's okay for a man to marry a man or a woman to marry a woman. It's okay. It's okay to redefine marriage when God's already defined what marriage is. Can you imagine there would ever be a day when that would happen? Folks, we need leaders who are looking up. Number two, we need homes that are holy. You know, it's easy to say, well, I tell you what, if those folks in Washington, if they would do right, then our country would straighten out. Or, or it, it, our country would be the kind of country it should be if, uh, if they'd make this law or do this or veto this. And, and then America would be back on the right path. Or if the Supreme Court would just read the Bible and read the Constitution, and, uh, and then they would change their mind. Or if Governor Deal would give money to this person and take money from that person, then things would be okay. And, uh, but can I say to you that uh, more than and what goes on in Washington and Atlanta. They're not to blame for everything. Most things are the problem of our homes. <clears throat> Do some research one day and you'll realize the Bible has a whole lot more to say about the home than it does the government. Let that sink in. The Bible, God has more to say about your and I, uh, our homes 
than it does our government. You see, what mom and dad do is way more important to God than what some politicians does. And the decisions you and I make in our homes, it matters more to God than the decisions made uh, in, in Washington. God's more concerned about our house and, and this house than he is the White House. He's more concerned about the, uh, what you and I do than what they do. No matter how far our society slips away from the principles of the Bible, you and I who claim to follow God and His Word, you and I have the responsibility to operate our homes according to, thus saith the Lord. No matter what su the uh, Supreme Court says, no matter what Washington says, you and I have a duty, a responsibility, a calling to run our homes according to, thus saith the Lord. Let me give you some examples. We need homes that are holy. According to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, the husband's the head of the home and the wife says to submit to his leadership. And if that's not happening in your home, then your home is not holy. E Ephesians 5, 25 and 33, the Bible tells us husbands to love our wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And if that's not happening in your home, then your home is not a holy home. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, children are to be obedient to their parents and honor their mom and dad. And if that's not happening, then your home is not a holy home. According to Deuteronomy chapter 6, we parents are to be teaching our children the Word of God by word and by deed. And if that's not happening, then your home is not a holy home. According to Joshua 24, uh, uh, we as fathers are to determine for our family that come what may, we're going to serve God. And if that's not happening in your home, then your home is not a holy home. And according to Hebrews chapter 10, uh, the family is supposed to be faithful to the house of God. And listen, if your family is not faithful to the house of God, then your home is not a holy home. So can I say this? Listen, problems in America are not so much the result of politicians and, and programs and rules and votes and policies. Uh, uh, most of the problem is caused by our homes. And I can imagine, like I sometimes like to imagine what God's doing. And I can imagine that as He sees our homes, see what's happening in our homes, and, and I, I can promise you that I believe His heart gets much more broken over what happens in our family and in our church and in our home than He does than what happens on the Supreme Court. And I'm sure His heart's more broken about the decisions we make than He is about the decisions that some judges make. <clears throat> It doesn't matter who's in charge of Washington. It doesn't matter who the head of the Supreme Court is. What matters is who's in charge of our homes. Can I say, America, what we really need are leaders who are looking up. What we really need are homes that are holy. What we really need, number three, are churches that are Christ-centered. I do a lot of uh, research on the Internet, and one of my, I don't know if hobbies is the word, one of the things I like to do, I like to look at other church websites and get... Ideas, if you will. And you would be astonished at what some uh, churches, what things that they do in the name of church. I've told you this one before, but I, I, it needs to be repeated. Uh, there's a church in Metro Charlotte, North Carolina, that one Sunday had a promotion. It was called this, Shots for the Savior. And I thought, well, great. Brother Marty going to have their bus kids in. Everybody gets to shoot a free throw. If you make a free throw, you get a piece of bubble gum. But that's not what they were talking about. You bring a visitor to church that Sunday, and you and that visitor get a shot of whiskey. By the way, it was record attendance that Sunday. I read this on a church website. Uh... You click on these churches and up at the top it'll say like what we believe, what to expect or whatever. Here's what this church uh, said, what to expect. We want you to feel comfortable at our church so there is no dress code. You'll feel welcome in anything from a bikini to a tuxedo. We're not here to judge you, we're here to help you. Here's another one. Uh, the, it's from another church. The Bible is optional. We may or may not even open the Bible. Our pastor's talks 
are really relevant, so his stories may have nothing to do with the Bible. <clears throat> now, here's another church, a very large church. If I said the man's name, you would know him. He's here in metro Atlanta. And here's what he said about his church. Doctrine is not that important here at blank church. Our worship experience begins and ends with music. If I change our doctrine, it would go unnoticed. But if I change our music, our church would cease to exist. <clears throat> a very famous preacher, and if I called his name, you would know him. He's on Fox News a lot. He's been interviewed by all the, the big interviewers. He's made millions of dollars writing books and all that kind of stuff. And here's what he said. What is sin to one person may not be sin to another person. What was sin 2,000 years ago does not necessarily mean that it is still sin. After all, if God, doesn't want us, if God doesn't want us to do certain things, then why don't He just get rid of those things? <clears throat> America needs churches that are Christ-centered. And there's too many churches that have gone the way of the world just to get a crowd, just to get 10,000 people come in and put money in the offering plate. They'll do whatever. They'll have a rock concert. They'll do this. They'll give out whiskey. They'll do this and do that just to get a crowd. But can I say to you, when you go the way of the world and you forsake your Bible just to get a crowd, you don't have a church. All you have is a crowd. Because I, I believe this, ten people with the right doctrine and the right purpose can get more, for God, more done for God than 10,000 people can with no purpose and no doctrine. But we complain about what other churches are doing. And uh, listen, and we can't do one single thing about what such and such community church is doing. Our concern is our church. And can I say this tonight? I don't know uh, who your next pastor would be after I'm long gone, but I do know this, as long as I am the pastor, we're going to say as much as within my power, we're going to stay centered on Jesus Christ. And we're going to do all that we can do to make sure the gospel gets to the uttermost parts of the world according to the Great Commission. And we're going to do all that we can do to keep those buses running down there to pick up boys and girls and bring them to church so they can hear about Jesus. And we're going to do all that we can to have music that honors God and speaks to the heart before it speaks to the flesh. And, and we're going to continue using the King James Bible in every Sunday school class, in every pulpit, uh, as long as I'm around, and no other version's going to be tolerated. <clears throat> you know, sometimes I walk around, and I, I hate to admit this in front of a crowd, but if I'm walking around and see uh, another version of the Bible, I'll grab it, and i walk to the trash can, and I'll drop it in. <clears throat> Because it's just garbage. We're going to do all that we can to preach salvation by grace through faith given to us by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're going to preach against things that are wrong and preach two things that are right. We're going to keep on encouraging and training and doing all that we can to make sure that this generation knows where there's a church where the gospel is preached. And as much as it breaks our heart about where some churches are today... <clears throat> Our business is what happens right here at 1410 Valley Hill Road. We can't do anything about what those churches are doing, but we can do something about what our church is doing, and our church must stay Christ-centered because that's what America needs. Number one, we need leaders that are looking up. We need homes that are holy. We need uh, churches that are Christ-centered. And finally, back in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we need Christians that are calling on God. You know, if we're ever going to be the country we are supposed to be, uh, we do need leaders that are looking up. And we do need our homes to be holy. We do need our church to be Christ-centered. And if those three things are ever going to happen, we must, uh, we must be Christians that do what God told Solomon to do. We must be Christians who are going to pray. Look at back at verse 14, please. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If, just two letters but a big word, if. In other words, there's a, there's a, there's a possibility that if not... 
If God says, I'll do this if we Christians do this. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, God says, and, and turn from their wicked ways, and, and uh, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. There's a proper order to having restoration in America. And it begins with you and I, who are God's people, praying and seeking His face. You know, our country is out of hand. But God's still in control. And it may be, listen, it may be church that God is just waiting for you and I to spend time on our knees praying for restoration of our country. Listen, America's being controlled by Satan, the God of this world. Uh, but listen, but help for America is just a prayer away. I want to close with this tonight. Uh, my sister emailed me this about three months ago now, and I saved it for a service much like this. Uh, remember that our country right now is being controlled by Satan. I believe that with all my heart. And uh, she emailed me this. She actually emailed me a video, and I had to go and try to find the words written down so I could read the words. I didn't want to show you a video. Uh, believe it or not, this was a speech given by Paul Harvey in 1965, 50 years ago, this speech was, was, um, was said or was read or whatever. And he, is, he was 50 years ago, if my math is right, 50 years ago, he's warning America uh, about some things. And, and as I read this, it is going to be uh, uh, astonishing how he hit the nail on the head. And I don't know if Paul Harvey was a Christian. I have no idea, but I do know he's very wise. <clears throat> Fifty years ago, here's what Paul Harvey said. The title is, If I Were the Devil. If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness, and I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree the America. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd, have, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves, until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects but neglect to discipline emotions. Just let those run wild until before you knew it, uh, you'd have to buy drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door 50 years ago. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse and from the schoolhouse and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbols of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a tree. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who want it until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what do you bet I could get, the whole, uh, get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich? I would caution against extremes like hard work and patriotism and moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be, 
And thus I could undress you in public. I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Written 50 years ago. I believe we're there, folks. And I believe that the only cure to our problems today is not a new president, is not a new Congress, is not a new, uh, a new Senate, is not nine new judges. I think the answer for today's problems is this. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from our wicked ways, then, God says, I'll hear from heaven and then I'll heal their land. Our greatest need is not political reform. It's not to abolish the IRS. It's not health care reform. It's not new leadership in the White House. America's greatest needs are leaders that are looking up and homes that are holy and churches that are Christ-centered and, uh, and Christians that are calling on God. Would you please stand to your feet tonight? <clears throat> And I want to do something tonight a little bit different in the event uh, of what's happened this week. I want to do this. I want to ask all who are able, would you mind please coming to the altar and bowing in prayer, please, if you're able to. If not able to, please stay there where you are in your seat, please, and just if you can kneel or whatever. But please bow your heads for just a moment. And uh, we're going to spend some time tonight according to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And we're going to pray. And we're going to pray. You know, we can complain all we want to. And we can say, well, if they do this, if they would do that, if, uh, if he would make this decision, if, he would, if we'd vote for this guy or this girl or whatever, if we could have the first this is president or the first this is president, then our country would be great. And I think that's got nothing to do with what's great in our country. What's going to help our country, according to the Bible, is for God's people to pray. So I'd ask you, let's take about maybe just a minute and just silent prayer there, please, and I'll, and I'll close this out in prayer, okay? So just pray for yourself, or pray by yourself for just a moment, and then I'll close this out in prayer.